The governor of Edo State, Godwin Obasaki, has stated that the country is in huge financial trouble. He disclosed this at the State Transition Committee Stakeholders Engagement. Obasaki noted that the federal government printed about 50 to 60 billion naira to share in the month of March. While speaking on the economy, he opined that by the end of 2021, Nigeria's total borrowings would be within 15 to 16 trillion naira. My question is, is the economy worse than what we believe it is? Well, joining us to have this conversation is Gospel Obele. He's an economist and Ignatius Chuku, a business journalist. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for joining us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right. Well, let me start with you, Mr. Chuku. Um, let's talk about the FAAC um, March allocation. According to Governor um, Godwin Obasaki, uh, he said that 50 to 60 billion naira um, was top, top for states to share. And he also made an, an allegation that the country's total borrowings may uh, be within 15 to 16 trillion naira. Now, please explain to us, uh, the common person, um, why this may be a problem as compared to normal borrowing. Because every other day, countries borrow. They're countries who keep borrowing and are indebted. But how bad is it? Well, uh, my reaction is that um, the person talking to us is not an economist um, and is not a financial manager for the nation. We have the Department of, uh, of the, we have the Debt Management Office, and we have the FAC and the Central Bank and other pieces of government that manage loans and borrowing. So, but that does not mean that what he said is is uh, wrong or right. No, I'm not saying that way. Mm -hmm. I'm saying that whenever the Bureau of Statistics or the Central Bank or the other agency, the DMO, whenever they want to uh, give a statement on uh, the on, on loans, they give us the total picture so that you can analyze. Okay. But the governor is saying from a point of alarm that this is how bad this are getting to. We're not saying it's a lie, but he has only reviewed an aspect of our problems. It's not the total picture. That Nigeria is borrowing and continue to borrow using ways and means printing, printing, uh, which is uh, the Naira. If you don't have resources to back it up and you print, uh, you can only divide your currency. So, he has only raised alarm, and it shows that there is need, there is need for action of the stakeholders on our extent of borrowing. That's what I can say at this point. Well, uh, again, I, I'm glad that you started by saying that he is not, you know, uh, a financial person, and hence why we have you here because you obviously understand the numbers, and so you'd be able to explain some things to us. Um, he also said something, and I'd like to quote it. He says, we have run a very strange presidential system where um, the local, state, and federal government at the end of the month go and earn salaries. Well, the only country in the world that does this. Um, does that, business-wise, from an economic perspective, is it wise that we continue to run this system where uh, states go to the federal government cap in hand for allocations. Um, has that also contributed to where our economy is today? Um, it is wrong to say cap in hand because uh, the constitution is very clear. The resources of Nigeria, the income of Nigeria does not belong to, to one, one tier of government. Mm -hmm. It belongs to the federation. Okay. And the federation has three layers of govern government, which means three layers of government own the money. So no one is going cap in hand to the other, not at all. So they are, it, it only means that the owners, the owners are the state, the local government, the states, and the federal government. So and there is a sharing formula. Going cap in hand is when you have collected your constitutional rights, your constitutional share then you will not go to either a state government or the federal government for bailout. It is bailout that is called cap your hand. But when it is your right in your father's, father's property, when you are asking for your right or when you have gone to collect your share of your father's property, you are not going cap your hand. It is when you have collected your share, but you want more ration 
or, or loan or bailout, then we cannot call it cap in hand. But what what the, the, what that statement is trying to show is that there is need for restructuring. There is need for restructuring whereby every tier of government will have direct rights to its income. And then there will be no need to share anything. You earn your own income and remit remit the tax or a percentage or whatever the law says to the center. You are not going to share anything. But the system we are running now is that let all the family eggs come into one basket. Then we now come there and say, okay, first wife and your children take this percentage. Second wife, take this. No one is a beggar in that arrangement. But if we change the system and if there's restructuring, it will now mean that you earn directly from your resources, you remit the share of the center, and you, at the end of the month, you're not going anywhere to, to share anything again. Okay. I think that statement is only calling attention to the need for fiscal federalism. That is all. Interesting. Um, Gospel Obele, I'm going to come to you with this question. Um, the governor of Edo State did say that we're in a huge financial trouble. What do you think he means? Is Nigeria in trouble financially? Um, so it's not really a function of if the governor has said so or not. It's a function of what um, the narrative has been so far. And um, it, he just spoke to um, something that already exists for a long time. You know, and a conversation that a lot of analysts have been putting out there that a lot of political and state actors have not adhered or agreed to in the sense. So, yes, he's very correct to a very large extent. And um, the financial mess we are in cuts across different perspectives, going from public expenditure to the capital markets to, to the corporate um, environment and borrowings and all of that. So, in, in its entirety, the Nigerian financial system you know, and the, the, the public sector, in a sense, it's in a severe um, financial position. Um, with, with what's the last, um, the other guest has just said, you talked about, um, you know, autonomy, and of course, you talked about fiscal uh, federalism. Uh, um, and of course, we've been talking about restructuring in this country on a political base, but um, with all of the things that we're seeing now, shouldn't you have had had forced the hands of government, not, I'm not talking about today, I'm talking about five years ago, or maybe even six years ago, to really um, look at the issue of, you know, fiscal federalism or restructuring instead of just, you know, paying lip service to it. Could he, could he have saved us some of the trouble that we seem to be facing today, especially when we talk about the economy and finances? Yes, definitely, definitely, to a very, very large extent. You know, what we've experienced has been a case of what we call fiscal indiscipline, all right? And then um, we find a situation where a lot of political actors are not willing, even if they may have been politically correct over the years through their speeches and all that, all right? They have not been willing to do the needful. And um, this has happened, and it's not, a, it's not an administration issue over a period of time in the last decades and all of that. So it's just the fact that um, we're in a climb where political actors and even other institutional actors are not ready to do what's necessary, you know, to enable or help the economy bounce back financially, you know, and all of that. So it's, it's a severe case in a sense, like I mentioned earlier on. If we had done all these things since and rejigged what we were supposed to do earlier on, we would not have found ourselves in this position. And also to state that it is not just a political economic issue. There are a lot of enabling institutional factors and laws and policies that, that helps or empowers the current situation to remain the way it is, okay. all right? So if you're talking about fiscal federalism and the need for a change and restructuring change, that conversation will run very deep in the system in terms of um, enabling laws, enabling institutions, enabling uh, policies and all of these things, all right, that have to come to play first before we see fiscal federalism. So there, there are a series of actions that must be in place, first of all, before we arrive at the conversation of fiscal federalism or restructuring. But it's a very long shot. Um, I don't think institutional actors, both on the political and non-political side, are willing to do anything important in this space. Is this, is this not also uh, Governor Basaki implicating himself? Because you're also saying that, look, if we are talking about a form of restructuring and the governor himself has been saying that this has to happen, he himself has, what has he done in his state? That would have been a good question for the governor. 
to, to fight or push for this restructuring that every politician always bandies about when it's close to elections. Uh, could governors on their oh. own advocate for this or, I mean, does it have to be a concerted effort across board? So, first of all, in my opinion, I think the governor was speaking objectively as an economist slash investment banker that he has been over the years, just like every private sector expert will speak. Because if you watch that clip very well, at the beginning, he made mention of wearing the cap as an economist or an, as an investment banker. All right. So that said, um, I don't think that the efforts are going to be in the hand of one political actor, because the issues around the structuring, fiscal federalism, state competitiveness, and all of these things are very structural. They are very structural to a very large extent. So, and structural issues in a crime such as this cannot be fought alone by a single man. All right, so there has to be a level of coordination. But there could be a start. Of, uh, How many governors have yeah. looked within their state to see if they could do other things other than wait for the oil monies to come to through the FA of FAAC? Yes, of course. So th there's a whole lot more that can be done, for instance, in those states to scale these things. A lot of, um, I mean, he was once a chief economist slash essay to a former governor. So, I mean, so there are a lot of economic ideas and, and initiatives that can be rolled out within the states there. And if you look at it from an angle of the brave states, meaning the South-South the region, there's a whole lot more that can be do, done at that level also, all right, than waiting for FAC or the federal government to come to the picture, all right? So, uh, the, but in, in terms of uh, Edo State in itself, <laughs> there are local institutional factors that impede those things, all right? So if, if it's going to happen, then the political will of, of not just the governor, but also the, the three tier of government has to come to play, all right, along with other institutional factors to make it happen right there. So okay. it's, it's, like I mentioned earlier, it's a long shot. And every of those conversations I said, every of those things I said earlier on exists at the federal and at the state level. So at the state level, the governor has to be willing all of his political aids, essays, and the legislative and judiciary arm of a state have to be willing, all right, and they have to build partnerships with key stakeholders in the state and ensure that everybody can see the benefits of a win-win and then take off from there, all right? So trying to get to that level of engagement and collaboration is the big question that okay. we've not been able to solve. But okay. even if the governor is willing, if the other tiers of government and other institutional slash stakeholder groups are not willing, there is nothing the governor can do, no matter how um, um, how willing, politically he is. willing okay. he is. Yeah. Okay. Back to you, finally, Mr. Uh, Ignatio Chiku. Let's look quickly at the financial and um, economic implications of Shell um, pulling out of Nigeria, and of course Chevron divesting into something else other than you know crude oil. Um, what effects will it have on the economy at large? Uh. Okay, before I say anything on that, quickly, let me say that as long as we are running the system we are running right now, as well as we are not thinking in terms of restructuring, in terms of fiscal federalism, the size of governance will continue to be so heavy that it will impact on every budget. The, if you restructure now, the first thing that will happen is that every state will pay the number of civil servants they can afford to pay. But when we are running a centrist system, whenever they want to say, okay, let us uh, decentralize the labor, so states will pay minimum wage as they can. Labor will go up in, in flames and shut down National Assembly so that nobody will debate, debate it. So in one moment, we want fiscal federalism. In another moment, we don't want fiscal federalism when it doesn't favor us. That's by the way. But uh, coming to uh, trying to find out what will happen if a company like Shell diverse. Um, Shell is a very big organization worldwide. The, their divestment, the Shell has been divesting in the past 10 years in so many ways. You know, they have been stepping out, stepping away from a, a, what we call marginal field, mm -hmm. uh, onshore. They have been going offshore. Many oil, the mega oil companies have been divesting, and the Shell particularly is trying to be, be a, an energy company instead of an oil company. Okay. In which case, they are pumping money into uh, other investments around energy, uh, non-oil energy, renewable energy. So they, are, they, they, they want to be known more as an energy company than well, as an oil How does this affect our company. economy in closing? We need to go. We're out of time. Pardon? How does this affect the Nigerian economy in closing? We need to go now. Well, if, if it's in terms of still working out of Nigeria, 
it will affect a lot. But if it's in terms of shifting their focus from one form of investment to another form of investment, it will be a matter of sectors we lose, new sectors we win. But okay. if it's the abstract investment and quitting Nigeria, then the impact will be colossal. All right. Well, I want to say thank you. Uh, Ignatius Chuku is a business journalist. Uh, he works for Business Day. And, of course, uh, I want to say thank you to Gospel Obele. He's an economist. Thank you, gentlemen, for speaking with us. Thank you very thank much. You, sir. All right. We'll take a short break now. And when we return, I will be giving you my take. Well, here's my take. Uh, well, 2023 is in view and politicians have been um, strategizing. And of course, as usual, thuggery and of course, violence has become the order of the day. Yes, of course, we have seen what's happening in um, the PDP um, convention or rather the Congress that's happening in the Southwest, one would have thought that it would be really peaceful, but of course we've had all kinds of uh, stories come out of it. Uh, we've seen people try to break into the venue of this particular event to cause mayhem. But one would wonder, what are these people fighting for? If it's an election where we are asking people to lead us, or these people are asking us for an opportunity to lead us, why are we having so much drama and dragging, pushing and shelf? And of course, the issues of stories emerging when they're not necessarily true. What kind of sentiments are these politicians trying to get out of us? Well, like I always say, as they're strategizing, as they're putting out their stories, we must be wise. We must be careful, we must watch, and we must make sure that at the end of the day, when the time comes for us to make our votes count, let's be wise in casting those votes. I am Mariana Cohn, thanking you for being part of the show. Have a good evening.